It's that time of week. Catch up with Michael Tulip. And Mike, Illinois is on a three game win streak since that loss to Indiana. They've won seven of eight. So there's been two wins since then. I think you feel really good about what happened at Wisconsin despite an ugly start and uh, not as good against Nebraska with uh, defensive issues in the first half. But boy, they clamped down. Um, in the second half, especially the final 12 minutes. So you, you got any big takeaways from kind of conglomerating those two games together? If you want to win in this league, we've talked about it. You got to be able to win ugly. And uh, I think I, I joked about it on post game that Nicola Moretti probably thought he got dropped on Mars uh, for the first half of that Wisconsin game. Wasn't a, uh, wasn't the best showing for American basketball, um, but they figured it out, man. They exploited the mismatches, I mean, Wisconsin isn't very strong in terms of their athleticism and length on the wing. And that's exactly what Illinois went after. And they went back to the well time and time again with, with Matthew Meyer. But um, look, you have to be able to win ugly in this league. And and they were due for probably a couple ugly ones. Uh, and, and I thought in the Nebraska game in particular, I thought their effort was good. It's just, about channeling that in the right way because the majority of their mistakes right now are, are really just when they let their guard down on the scout. Um, and that's true for a lot of teams, but particularly with this team, they're so good defensively that if they can just fine tune that a little bit, that just, that takes them up uh, another notch. And, you know, that's, that's going under screens, that's losing shooters. That's not recognizing what the opposing defense is trying to exploit and exploiting that Um, little things like that. And that's where the game to me against Nebraska turned offensively. It was kind of a slog to start the game and they kept driving into the two guys that are low holding under the basket. That's what they're designed to do. They low hold the guys underneath the basket. They want to be in rotation. They want you to skip it. Uh, And they, well, they want you to shoot contested shots with three guys underneath. What they don't want is for you to, be able to really pinball the ball around and drive it. And that's what they ended up doing. They started recognizing that that corner is where that low hold guy will never be like, that's, that's his guy. He's typically leaving, skip it to the corner, move it around. They started doing that. The game kind of opened up, but their effort and particularly the freshmen in that second half were a big reason why I thought that blew open. Yeah. I want to get into the offensive things right now. I want to get into that. Hey, they've done what we thought they could do, which is get towards the top of the league with, with this stretch of games in January. Uh, and we've got to get into what is, I think just a massive fun rivalry. I think mutual rivalry uh, between Illinois and Iowa coming up here on Saturday, but you mentioned the freshmen and it, this feels like a game where they were coming of age. Like, like Jaden Epps has been there. It feels like, especially since he's been inserted into the starting lineup over the last month. But but Ty Rogers, um, you know, it's been like every other game for him, but you have that now in, in your repertoire. And, and Sincere Harris uh, with another game where, where he leaves an impact on winning. Uh, just what did you see out of those guys to help spark that win? Yeah, well, I think it's contributed a lot to this team winning games. And I don't just say that flippantly because there's teams in this league that are struggling with that. There's teams in this league where – they don't have a defined three through nine and it's killing them because guys don't know their roles. Uh, that's Michigan's biggest problem right now. I don't think Juwan knows who to throw in, when to throw them in. There's no continuity. And that hurts your top guys. That hurts Hunter Dickinson. That hurts Jet Howard when they don't know who to expect around them, how they play. And there's everything's just off kilter and out of rhythm and, this Illinois team on the flip side, it's a reason why they're pretty high up in this league. Now that's the reason why they're, they're tied for second in this league is because I really think they've solidified that three through nine. I think we know Matthew Meyer, Terrence Shannon are probably the top two guys, depending on how you value Coleman Hawkins, you can maybe throw them in there, but they're three through not three through nine, or it's just really solid. And each guy knows who they are. And particularly the freshmen, I'll, I'll go through each one of them. Jaden Epps, in ter- as I'm watching point guards in this league, I don't think there's many point guards that are better at, at going off script. And I know that sounds bad, but he is so good when things break down, being able to find his spot, get to the basket. I mean, he's finishing for a guy that's probably a little over six foot, being able to finish at that rate around the rim is imperative because there's, there's so many teams in this league that want to take that type of stuff away. 
And when you can break down a defense like that, you, you completely compromise what these teams are trying to do. And Ty Rogers, his identity, although it's always been running around and grabbing offensive rebounds and being the hustle guy, his identity now has been, hey, who's the opposing team's best perimeter player? And if we need to give Terrence Shannon a blow, and if we need to give somebody else a blow, like we got a guy who arguably is probably our best on the ball defender that we can throw in there. And if you think about these other teams, right? If I'm Sam Greasel or if I'm any of these guys on these other teams, Bryce Sensible, and I'm like, I take that deep breath when Terrence Shannon subs out. Oh, all right, this is my chance. And then you got this guy coming in who, you know, arguably might be a better defender than Terrence. Um, and that's not a slight on Terrence whatsoever. That That's how good Ty Rogers is sliding his feet on the ball instincts. I mean, it's, it's off the charts. And then sincere Harris was a big reason why that game went from 50 to 48 to 56, 50 it, his effort and getting out in the fast, get on the fast break, you know, pressuring the ball, all of that, it was all tied in together. And those freshmen were, were a big, big reason for that. Jaden, it tied all in Jaden having some tough shots in big moments. I think it was 56, 50 and, and Jaden went to the basket and was able to draw a foul and make some free throws. They've done it in different ways. And then just when you think these, these freshmen aren't doing much, it's, it's Matthew Meyer killing you at Wisconsin. It's Terrence Shannon against UCLA and it's Coleman Hawkins having a major impact against Ohio state. That speaks to the talent of this team. And we talked about it preseason, how I think you can throw them up there with any team in this league, mono a mono talent wise and the pieces you know, one through nine, it, it's pretty incredible. And it, it, it gives you a sense of <clears throat> comfort when you think about rolling into March and saying, man, this guy may not have it this game, but that's okay because we can supplement that in other areas. And I think that's what you've seen. Well, Mike, one concern that certainly has developed recently, especially during Big Ten play, despite a, the great streak of winning, which is defense and their two-point making ability, is their shooting. They are 13th in the Big Ten right now at 29.3% from three. Terrence Shannon has dropped to 25% from three during conference play. We know the shooting slump that R.J. Melendez is in. The good news is you have a guy like Matthew Meyer who can absolutely go off like he did against Wisconsin. You have Jade Neps who has shown his ability just to consistently get double-digit scoring for a freshman but how big of a concern right now is offense and scoring for the long term, for the ceiling potential of this team? Well, the lack of shooting actually doesn't concern me because to me, it's a quality of shot issue and not a shooter issue. Mm -hmm. And that can be rectified. If you just got bad shooters, not much you can do. This team has good shooters. Like Terrence Shannon can shoot the ball. He's proven it. Texas Tech, where he was much more catch and shoot, Yes. And that's part of the reason why he was more in the high 30s. Uh, R.J. Melendez, I think we've seen it. Um, I know small sample size last year, but I've watched him in practice. And like, the kid can shoot the ball. It's just a matter of him mechanically figuring some things out right now. Matthew Meyer, we know he can shoot the ball. But for all these guys, it's what quality of shot are you taking? Because when that quality of shot's low, it's going to be really hard to consistently shoot a high percentage. You can have the eight for nine nights like you do, like Terrence did against UCLA. But as the season goes on, when you continue to take tough ones, you know, that's, that's, that's going to hurt you. But the reason why right now it's probably not being talked about as much because their defense is pretty damn good. Um, <laughs> and I think that there's going to be positive regression. I just think these guys are too good as shooters. And I think it's going to be addressed in a way where it's like, hey, we, instead of taking 28 threes in a game, we can take 20 good ones. Uh, and, and if that results in somewhere between seven to nine makes because of the quality, now you're right there in the 35 to 45%, 45 on the really good shooting nights and 35 on, Hey, we were seven for 20. We were six for 19, whatever, whatever it is. And that's how you rectify that. Um, but the, you have shooters. I, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. So not as much of a concern, but if the quality of shot continues the way that it is, then yeah, I think you, you get into March and, you run into a team that can really shoot it. You run into an Iowa who yeah. doesn't really care if you have a good defense. They're going to find ways to score the ball. Um, now you got it. Now quality becomes of that much more important. So that's that's really what I'm looking for moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's like you know, obviously you don't want to shoot 29 percent from three, but when you pair that with 
your rate of three point shots to your field goal attempts is fourth most in the big 10. Like that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Especially when you're the number one, two point percentage team in the big 10. And think about that. That's over Purdue uh, with, with Zach Eady in the middle. So that, I, I think you're right, Mike. It's it's the shot selection. And I think Terrence Shannon is the perfect example of that. Like, I'm not going to complain too much about Matthew Meyer because we've seen him and his ability to make those, though I'd like him at some times to, to drive the ball. But but Shannon seems clearly a better catch and shoot guy than he is off the bounce. Not that you never want him to shoot off the bounce. Yeah. And I also think, too, Terrence, because of his size, and if he has a smaller person on him, like he has the ability to, to shoot over guys and he can do a lot of damage with five attempts a game, mm-hmm. five or six really good attempts per game. It, his focus should always be getting to the basket. Cause at least if he gets to the basket, he can get to the free throw line that can maybe open up some things, not only just to feel better when you're taking those outside shots, but your your the defense has to honor the drive a little bit more. So whether that's a jab to create a little bit more space, but you know, some of his step back, like, I mean, even the one he hit to start the game against Nebraska was from like 31 feet. So it, he's going to have to pick his spots, but these guys have a lot of freedom and you, what you don't want to do with guys that are capable shooters is make them start second guessing when to shoot. Um, it's just, it's a feel thing. You got to understand time and score moment. And I think these guys will do that. And I think they got to understand, man, like your defense is that good. Um, but I think there's always, <laughs> I thought about this during the Nebraska game. Sometimes I think you can let up defensively because you think your offense is so good. And I think you can let up offensively because you think your defense is so good. Hmm. And I'm not sure if I'm probably overanalyzing or drilling into psychology too much, but like when you have this notion, everyone's talking about your elite defense, this, that, and it's like, maybe I can take this shot. I know we're going to stop them. So who cares? And it's like, man, that next step, if you want to be great, if you want to be a second weekend, if you want to be in a, elite eight final four type team is truly valuing both sides, bro. You got the defense. You got it. Now continue with the effort on that side. Don't, I shouldn't say you got it. Cause you don't want to have the mindset of like, we got it. You still have to put in the requisite amount of effort, but understanding, man, we can really help ourselves. If we, if we pick and choose our spots and just be basketball players and take good ones, then we help that elite defense out even more. We become tougher to score on it. In turn, we're shooting higher, percentage shots offensively so we, we just become tougher to beat overall mike you mentioned it with rj melendez uh last year was a small sample size but the first 10 games of the year shot 36 percent from three i think that's yeah take that the rest of the year right uh, especially with those corner threes he was doing really really well on um i mean this coincided with the shoulder injury but but there's clearly more to it you mentioned it you said mechanics uh, how do you get rj melendez out of this shooting slump you're a shooter what are you seeing out of him yeah, I mean, sometimes with guys that are in a shooting slump, what you don't want to do is overcomplicate things and be like, hey, you got to do – and then they'll start to overanalyze even more. It's just – it's it's doubling down on the trust you have in yourself as a shooter and understanding that it's going to pop. Like, it, I know everybody says the cliche of, like, I'm either hot or about to get hot. Mm-hmm. Um, that's got to be the mindset for him. He's going to get three to four good looks in a game and – it's just being able to take advantage of those right now. What, at least what I'm seeing and I'll, I'll show some of it in the film. I don't think he's, he's shot ready. And when I say shot ready, there's just a lot of upright standing catching and then going down and going up to shoot. And when you're shot ready, you take out that first part. Mm-hmm. We, we, we always talked about it with Luke Goody last year. Like he's just walking around campus shot ready. And when you do that one, you limit the time, that it takes to close out to you and get an even tougher contest. But two, like there's more fluidity to it. Like if I'm down shoot, I know if anybody's listening to this on a podcast, just envision it. But like, if I'm down shot ready, all I gotta do is catch and go up. Whereas if I'm not shot ready, I got to catch, go down and then go back up. And you just, you introduce too many other elements to it, including a defender getting closer to you and having a tougher contest. So that's got to be his focus. And it's hard. You got to train yourself to do it. it you, you know, you've been going up and down the floor for three minutes straight. Now you kind of jog in, in the corner and also the ball is getting swung to you and you can be caught standing upright, realize you're, you're open and feel like you got to take it. And that's just kind of the biggest thing I think for him is 
training yourself to continue to be shot ready and take out that first part of the dip in his shot. And I think he'll see more open shots because it'll be less of a closeout. But two, I think he'll just, he'll see a few more go in. And if he sees a few more go in guys that are good shooters like that, they'll, they'll be off to the races. Mike, you mentioned his name. I think when we talk about, Hey, this team needs shooting and you have Luke Goody potentially returning soon. He's the elixir in a lot of people's minds. I want to ask you as, as a player who's seen people come back from injury, probably had injuries yourself. Uh, this is a serious foot injury. He has not practiced five on five to our knowledge yet. Sounds like he could get cleared soon, but we have six weeks left in the season. He hasn't played with this team, hasn't been part of the rotation. Um, so I think it's good. If you get Luke Goody back, it's an option you didn't have and a potentially really, really good one. But what would be your expectations for, for Luke Goody as he comes back? What would you tell fans about that? Well, I think you always you always have to temper expectations with a guy, not only just with a foot injury, but coming back in the middle of a home stretch of a conference season and you feel like you have some identity, like I talked about with this rotation, this three through nine or three through eight, whatever you want to look at it one through eight. But look, I think for him, if there's anybody that could maybe come in and hit the ground running, it's a guy that you don't really have to depend on a ton to like pound and pound and have a ton of usage with the ball. And um, what he does well, he's, he's great positionally defensively. Um, I think he's an under, I think he's an underrated defender. Uh, We'll see what that looks like because as much as we talk about like the shooting and this and that, like, I, I do think there's an element of what's he going to look like defensively? Cause if he's a step slow defensively, that's, what's going to be holding him back from playing maybe his traditional amount of minutes, but offensively he's a spacer. Uh, he's a catch and shoot guy. He fights his ass off on the glass and shoot. You can plug and play a guy like that. Uh, so I'm not worried about the offensive end for him. It's, it's defensively when you have this elite defense, if he's still working back in a step slow, uh, the minutes aren't going to be as abundant as maybe you would think they are. So, but if he does that, then that introduces a, another element where if he looks really good, he does enough good stuff, man, where he's, he's probably going to steal some of these minutes. Mike, I, I want you to take a victory lap here. You talked about the, the switching defense <laughs> and that part of the psychology of it is you don't have a guy. You are not responsible for a guy. And you might just let some things go because it's not your fault if it's not your guy. Uh, Coleman Hawkins brought that up this week, that when, when it's your guy, it's your scout, it's your responsibility, that that's part of their defensive turnaround. So I just wanted to, to give you that praise, man, because he nailed it there. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's a real thing. And it, it does, yeah, it does feel good to hear Coleman reiterate it. But at the same time, like, being in that locker room and understanding when you go out on the floor, like there's a different level of accountability when it's your guy. And also, yeah, I think it's another way for these guys. Look, they're 18 to 22 year olds. So just as much as you get excited about, man, I scored 18 points tonight or I scored 22 points tonight, whatever it is, there's something to be said about, yeah, man, this all big 10 guy, I held him to two for 11 from the field. Like there's like there, you can get a little bit of confidence from that. Um, that's a real thing. I think Coleman, honestly, we, we didn't, we, we talked about him a little bit as a defender, but after the Ron Harper game uh, where Ron Harper went two for 13 or whatever he did. And then Keegan Murray at Iowa, like he was great on Keegan. I think all of a sudden, I think maybe it's coincidence. He, all, he decided to believe himself a little bit more as a defender and became a better defender because just as much as you're like, man, I can get buckets at this level. Now I'm a confident shooter. I'm confident going to the line. There's confidence defensively and not second guessing and understanding that you are a, a bad matchup for guys like that and, and embracing that. And that's, that's a real thing. And I think these guys, a lot of guys in this team present that. Yeah. And Mike, think of the last three games for Coleman, Bryce Sensabaugh. He helped really slow down um, Tyler wall. He frustrated a lot. He got some of his points late in that game. Uh, and then I thought when he was on Greasel, yeah, it was very good. Like Greasel got shut down after 15 of the first 17 points. They put Coleman on him and Coleman uh, really slowed him down. So I, I agree with you. I think he, he talked about it. Like, yeah, he, he gets up for that a little bit. You should. And, and look, I think there's a lot of advantages to switching one through five. I totally get it. And it was funny when we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, when I mentioned that element of it going back to traditional matchups, it was something that just, I think kind of dawned on me. It was like, man, I at least know like competitively as a player, I used, you know, I used to really like that. And you can see how it's kind of permeated where it's like, 
there is a structure to their defense now, just beyond what they do and what they want to force, but there's a structure to the rotations and you're starting to see it, right? You got Dane traditionally on the big, you got Coleman, you, you start Terrence on the best perimeter player. If they got enough size and things go awry, you deploy Coleman Hawkins. If Terrence is doing well on them, then when Terrence comes out, you put Ty Rogers on them and any shooter that's RJ Melendez and Jay Nepp's job. Yep. And you, that's an identity, man. Like that's an identity defensively and guys all know each other's role. And when Tominaga is running down the left sideline in the first half and RJ Melendez is guarding Wilcher and Terrence Shannon's on Tominaga and Terrence Shannon points at RJ Melendez and is like, we need to switch. This is your guy. And RJ Melendez points back at him and says, no, just take him." And then all of a sudden Terrence gets bumped down a screen and Tommy Naga hits a three. And I see Terrence yelling at RJ. Like, that's what I'm talking about. That's accountability. Like maybe you can say, yeah, all right, Terrence, but like RJ, that's your matchup. Like that's your matchup. We have you on shooters for a reason. We don't want Terrence chasing all night. Yep. That's your job. That's Jay Nepp's job. And you can point to that. Whereas like when you're switching one through five, it's like, I don't know. Like, cool. All right, let's go try to get a bucket. Like it's, it, there's less accountability. So I think they've, they found that and they like really truly have this identity where like, Hey, guy gets beat. It's Matthew Meyer flying in and recovering. It's, you know, they have that it's predictable in a sense, but it's predictable in a good way to where you can kind of rely on it and say like, here are our pillars defensively. This is what we stick to. And guys get really, really good within that. There's no, guessing like what is my role tonight who am i guarding how am i going to make an impact it's like my job this is my job description do my job at a high level that's it yeah just uh i was going through a couple more guys that coleman defended jameson battle was four of 11 for eight points a couple weeks ago um malik hall had two points in 18 minutes i know he got injured but that was like late in that game joey hauser had 11 points on 11 shots Man, he's he's done incredibly well uh, during this stretch defensively, and, and even the first time around against Wisconsin, um, I know they didn't have Tyler Wall there, but he's doing a really really good job. And I'll, I'll say this about Coleman too. I think for him, you have all these guys, really good players in this conference, and for whatever reason, I, I think everyone knows Coleman Hawkins is a good defender, but there's something about him being a little bit unassuming. Uh, yeah, you know, he doesn't look like the quickest guy in the world. Hmm. He doesn't have like like he doesn't blow by you off the dribble offensively. So you wouldn't just sit there and peg him as like, dude, he's a freak athlete. So and then I think too defensively, it's like he doesn't look like he's sliding his feet lightning fast to cut you off. So I think I think teams get it and guys get it in their mind where like they can take him off the dribble or get a shot off over him. And he has those things, but his instincts. And his feel are what really puts him over the top and makes him just really, really hard to score on and to get things. And now he's taking it to another level. His talking, I've just been so impressed with his talking off the ball. He's pointing. He's always he's opening up a window for guys to cut through and get through on shooters and get over on shooters and get here, get there. Like that's where he's really taking this next step. He was already a good defender, but now you become such a valuable asset on that end. And, you know, we cannot talk about this Illinois defense without talking about Coleman Hawkins. Yeah. Like he's the reason they can do what they do. And he's the reason they do what they do at a high level. Um, I mean, there's no surprise that Matthew Meyer, we like all of a sudden he has, goes on this tirade of, of block shots. And the first person he mentions is Coleman Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I'm like getting my shot blocked in practice. Coleman Hawkins taught me how to be a better shot blocker. No surprise. Like he's been the catalyst on that end. And then now they're starting, like I said, fill in those other areas. Like, boom, Need someone to guard a shooter? R.J. Melendez, Jay Neps. Sincere Harris at times. Like, mm -hmm. need a guy to get into the ball three-quarters court? Like, Terrence Shannon, when he gets into the ball, like, there's a different type of feel. Jameson Battle, like, Jameson Battle, Sam Greasel, these bigger guys that want to handle the ball and initiate offense, Terrence Shannon picks them up three-quarters court. They can't dribble. Mm -hmm. He took the ball from him last night. You know, took a – and what was really impressive about that with Terrence, and I know I'm going on a tangent here, but a possession before that, Terrence Shannon got called for a foul. Sam Greasel completely flopped. Sam Greasel's run through the lane and he stopped, waited for Terrence Shannon to kind of run into him and he fell to the ground. They called a foul. Terrence was upset, shaking his head. And then that next possession, next defensive possession, he's picking up Sam Greasel three quarters court and takes the ball mm -hmm. and lays it in. 
And we saw that at Minnesota. And that's the, that has been like the corner that Terrence has turned is he doesn't just kind of go off into the abyss when things go wrong. Like he is, he is limiting that time where he has mistakes and he is just expediting it into how quickly can I turn something into a positive? And he's done it and it's helped his team out so much. So I know I went from, from talking about different things to getting into Terrence, but it reminded me of that. And it's, it's just been really impressive. Uh, all those guys I think have, have been able to do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going through Ted Lasso for the second time. He's being a goldfish apparently yeah. uh, for, for that. Uh, I, I do want to mention, yes, uh, Indiana bully ball, Coleman Hawkins, but that was the outlier so far during the, the last month. I cannot wait for this game. Uh, I, I've been looking forward to this game. I think this is a huge one for Illinois. It's a road game. Uh, I think they're going to be one or two point underdogs likely in this one. Iowa's playing pretty good basketball right now. Of course, they are one of the best. They are the best offense uh, efficiency in the Big Ten right now. Um, I, I just think this is a great rivalry game. We've seen it this week play out between the Orange Crush and Iowa Athletic Department. Don't know if you got a take on that, Mike, um, but a phenomenal basketball matchup between two really good teams that I think still have, you know, among the best chances among Big Ten teams to go deep in the NCAA tournament. So what do you think of this matchup? I said it earlier, you better put the ball in the basket. You better put the ball in the basket, especially at Iowa. Um, they hurt you so much with their pace. Uh, they run good actions. Uh, you know, Murray's a pro. Rabrach has been probably one of the more underrated bigs in the conference this year. And then there's been a bit of an emergence of Aaron Eulis. I think his ability to be uh, – to really – steady that backcourt where initially you looked at Tony Perkins and probably thought he was a guy that can maybe be breakout candidate. He's been solid in the, in the past few games. Uh, Connor McCaffrey will, will fill in spots. I mean, I think he brings a lot of value to that team. I know not a lot of people like the kid, but uh, he, he plays the game the right way. He plays hard. Uh, he fights. And that's exactly you know how you want to fill in the different pieces of any team. And, Look for Ulysses in particular. Like this is, you know, this is three out of the last four games where he's been in double figures. I think I thought he was tremendous in that game at Michigan State uh, that they almost pulled off. He's just him and Perkins are such confrontational drivers. They they try to put you in in jail. They try to put you in foul trouble. Uh, he they took it straight to Ulysses in particular. Took it straight at Tyson Walker, who I think is a pretty good defender. Uh, took it right at him, like shoulder on chest into the basket. And that's you know I'm looking at Jaden Epps. And that's what these guys are going to try to do to you. And I think Jay Neps has come a long way. I think he's, he's, a, he's a plus defender. I really do believe that. And this is going to be a test for him. And um, look, Coleman's going to get the Murray assignment. I think we all know that. Um, you're, you're going to see probably Shannon on, on Perkins. Uh, but you can fill this in in different ways. Look, I'm looking at a guy like Peyton Sanford. You can play him off the floor. I saw it against Ohio State. Ohio State completely – they couldn't play him. They couldn't play him. There's too much size. There's too much athleticism. If you bum rush the offensive glass, if you make him guard in space, like they cannot play him. And that takes out a major weapon for them. So I want to see how they go about exploiting that because that's that's a huge mismatch that they can take advantage of. He's going to fight defensively. There's no question. Um, but you can you can exploit that because Ohio State did, and it was a big reason why they won that game because you limited them to having all these different weapons offensively, and, and it just came down to Murray trying to hit shots. And mm -hmm. I think it, I think that's a win for Illinois if it just comes down to things breaking down and, and Murray having to go get him go get it himself. Because uh, when they're really good is when they have the complimentary kind of three step of Rabrach is really doing Yeoman's work down low. You got Murray doing it at all three levels. And then you got Euless and Perkins kind of pushing the pace and being menaces. Uh, they'll run that 2 2 1 kind of token full court. So you have to take care of the ball. Uh, there's a lot of different elements. I was a good team. And they've, there's a reason why they've been uh, kind of on the rise here, here lately. And they beat a good Northwestern team. They, they beat them soundly in a way. So uh, they're going to have no shortage of fire. This has been a rivalry where over the years it's just grown and grown and grown after being dormant for, mm -hmm. for a number of years. So I'm excited. It's a, it's a good test for this Illinois team to go and take out a team that's that I, I believe if I'm looking at standings, they're, they're technically in the top half of yeah. the standings. Uh, Illinois doesn't have a ton of those wins. Um, they've beaten up on the, on the bottom half of the conference. Um, but at the same time, 
I'm not going to buy into this notion that this Illinois team can't beat top teams. You, you don't beat UCLA and Texas and then simultaneously be like, I don't know, like what are they going to look like against? They can beat those teams. It's just a matter of sticking to who you are and understanding the scout, limiting those errors, and and, and you could be in good shape here and put yourself in position, position to go eight and four. And I don't, I'm not sure you give yourself a shot at, at catching Purdue, but right now the focus should be on finishing out the season strong and, and getting to that those Friday games. Yeah, listen, this team has four quad one wins, I believe, at the moment. And some of those obviously can change as we go along here. Um, but Iowa would be one. Uh, going to Iowa and winning would be a very good win for your resume. I, since they lost to Eastern Illinois, which I still don't understand how that happened, they have at home beaten Indiana, Michigan, Maryland, Rutgers, Northwestern. That, that's an impressive run that Iowa is on right now. So that's why I feel like if Illinois goes in and wins this one, I'm just feeling different about what this team is capable of compared to what we were thinking a month ago. Because as you said, Mike, they've beaten some good teams, um, some some solid teams in the Big Ten. But I think this is a top four, top five team in the Big Ten. If you can go on the road and win, um, I just feel like it's, it's another level uh, that this team keeps building and building on. And it's a great test, right? Everybody talks about your defense, elite defense. Well, how do you stack up against a team that's top five efficiency wise in the, in the country? And how do you how do you fare against a team that's top ten in the country taking care of the ball? Like, you know, they're not going to beat themselves. Um, they don't. They shoot. They shoot at thirty five percent from three, so they're not just setting the world on fire on that end. But at the same time, I mean, this is a team that they they do lack some size in some areas. Um, so again, similar to Wisconsin, I know, you, I know you got Murray, I know you got Rebracha, um, but you can exploit that in some area. I mean, they're giving up 50%, 51% really from two. And this is a, an Illinois team that does a lot of damage inside the three point arc. So, um, what you can't do is come in there and, and be like, Hey, this is the game we're breaking out of the three point slump. So let's just shoot threes and see if, see if we can catch one, but I like to see a lot of free throw attempts in this game. Yes. Get downhill, exploit, you know, use it to your advantage. If they want to put Sanford on the floor, if they want to put um, Nick's, I think is maybe the other guy that they bring on the floor. Like you got to exploit those, those matchups and you got to take care of the ball because I was going to value their possessions. You have to do the same and you have to make them really, really work for uh, you know, for everything that they get on the offensive end. Yeah, chance for Iowa to continue their rise and, and tie with Illinois in the Big Ten standings, while Illinois it's a chance to get a quad one win and gain some separation. Can't wait for it on Saturday. Michael Tulip, thanks for the insight, as always, and making us basketball smarter, man. Appreciate it, man.